Hey, OCHEM students, I'm Ben Asman. This is Organic Chemistry, second semester, second experiment, electrophilic aromatic substitution. Let's get to it. Electrophilic aromatic substitution kind of remind us of our E1 reaction from OCHEM 1 in the fact that it has an electrophile and a nucleophile, but it often has a catalyst like aluminum trichloride. This is because the electrons on the aromatic ring actually have to break hermeticity to reach out and grab the electrophile. This newly created positive charge can cycle around the ring until eventually a base comes along and pops off a hydrogen, and thus restoring aromaticity. Now if we start off with an aromatic ring that already has a substituent on it, like this toluene, we have three different options for where we can add in our electrophile. The first is ortho, the second is meta, the third is para. The amounts that you get of each of these actually depends more on the substituent you started off with on the aromatic ring than it does about the electrophile that you actually used. Ethyl groups are ortho para direct. Para is a little bit less because there is some steric hindrance there, and meta is negligible because of resonance. A good example of a meta directing is nitro group. Notice this time ortho and para are negligible. Here's a chart of ortho and para directing. You can find the same one in weight, i.e. your textbook. Our substituent today is acetamin. Notice it's the ortho para directing, which means we would expect most of our product to be para. Lastly, let's take another quick look at that chart. You'll notice there's activators and deactivators. Activators as a whole provide enough electron density that they don't need a catalyst. Deactivators do need a catalyst because they take away electron density. The weird ones are the halides, which are both deactivators and ortho para directing. Remember when you're measuring the acetylid to have something to write it down with. The actual amount you take is more important than the amount that tells you to take in the book. Plus or minus 20 milligrams will be good from the 100 you need to take. Let's see what I got. 95. That's great. We have two waste bottles this time. One for non-halogenated solvents like acetone and the other one for anything that contained bromine. If you do plan on using acetone, make sure you clean your whatever it is with soap and water first. Then use a little bit of acetone just to get it nice and dry. Toss it into the container, never down the sink, and then let it air dry. Most of the setup for the rest of this lab is pretty straightforward. If you squeeze your weighing cup, it makes it easier to pour it in. If there's a hard part, it's definitely using these syringes. You don't measure at the tip of the plunger. You measure a little bit down from that, where the green part of the plunger meets the clear part of the syringe. The graduated pipette for the bromine isn't much better. The 0.25 mark is the first notch down from the tip. Now bromine is some nasty stuff, but you can still clean up with some paper towels. If you get it on your skin, that's bad news. You want to run for the thiosulfate. I poured a little bit of bromine on this sponge to simulate what will happen if you get it on your skin. It's pretty bad, you can see all the smoke coming off of it. Then I dumped a bunch of thiosulfate on top to quench it. After pulling it out, looks like it burned a hole through the thing. Back to the experiment. When you're waiting the 10 minutes for it to crystallize, flicking it a bit will make it go a little bit faster. Next we add the water, then we go ahead and put it in an ice bath, and we're going to go ahead and filter it. That's a butane funnel, we don't want that. Put that aside. This is a Hirsch funnel. We want the Hirsch funnel. That's the little guy. That's the one we're going to use. And the matching little filter paper. It's this little tiny guy. Just stick it in there. When you're ready to filter, you're going to have to break up your crystal. So cap it up and take it to the vortexer. When you're working with a vortexer, make sure you hold it nice and high. That way it doesn't go above your fingers. Granted, if you hold it too high and you don't have a cap, it's just going to splash all over you. Next step is to filter out your broken up crystals. In this shot, I already have my first filtration done, so I'm doing my second filtration with a little bit of extra water just to get what's left behind. When I dump it in, I dump it in all at once. These first set of crystals are kind of yellowy. That's because they have bromine on them. We need to recrystallize it to get it nice and pure. To do this, we need to transfer this to a nice new clean test tube. I recommend transferring it to a wake up first. Makes your life a lot easier. We're going to do our crystallization in hot 50% ethanol, 50% water, but it doesn't really dissolve it. Putting the test tube in the sand bath sideways makes your life a whole lot easier. Make sure you just point that away from people, including me, especially me. When you pull it out, it's going to be a little more clear. Let it come to room temperature, stick it in an ice bath, filter it again. Nice white crystals. Melt temp, bag them, tag them, you're done.